Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the previous episode, we ended by talking about the fact that during the Day of Judgment, Allah mentions to Bani Israel that intercession will not be accepted, and if it is, it will not benefit. Compensation will not be taken, compensation will not be accepted. Now, just to follow up on that, this concept was, of course, difficult for the people of the book to understand because they had been raised with this idea that they were the chosen nation. So they were the followers of the Abrahamic faith and they were the descendants of the righteous Yaqub So by default, they had this belief that intercession from Ibrahim and from Yaqub will easily get them into Jannah given their sacred lineage. It was hard for them to grasp this idea that even these prophets will not be able to intercede on their behalf. And even if they do intercede, it's not going to benefit them because these prophets are only going to speak the truth. So now the surah shifts to a detailed discussion of the actual message that Ibrahim and Yaqub preached so that the Jews and Christians could reflect on this and ask themselves, are they actually following Ibrahim and Yaqub? If not, how can they possibly believe that these prophets will argue before Allah in favor of a nation that did not even follow their message? So again, you can understand that there is this beautiful flow happening in Surah Baqarah that after now warning Bani Israel, finally, the early Muslims, that be careful, intercession will not benefit. And of course, for Bani Israel, intercession was everything because they were the chosen nation. They were the descendants of Yaqub So how is it possible that these prophets will not intercede for them and will not make sure that they're able to get into Jannah? So now you will see that there is this beautiful flow in the surah where now Allah is going to address Bani Israel and tell them that let me explain to you what exactly was the message of Ibrahim and Yaqub so you can understand why they will not intercede for you and even if they can intercede, their intercession is not going to benefit you because you're not actually following their message in the first place. So in verse 124, Allah says, and mention, O Muhammad, peace be upon him, when Ibrahim was tried by his Lord with commands and he fulfilled them. Allah said, Indeed, I will make you a leader for the people. Ibrahim said, And of my descendants? Allah said, My covenant does not include the wrongdoers. So Ibrahim was told to make many sacrifices in his life that are explained in detail throughout the Quran. It was his determination and faith in Islam that enabled him to pass all of his tests and be rewarded with leadership. In other words, he became an imam over religion. That is why in Judaism, Christianity and Islam, he is a very revered figure. That's why they are called the Abrahamic faiths. But in this verse, there are two misconceptions of Bani Israel that are being addressed. Firstly, Ibrahim made a prayer asking Allah, that leaders should be made from his descendants, from his children as well. Now, his children include Ismail and Isaac. So the people of the book should not be shocked that Allah has sent the final prophet amongst Bani Ismail. This is actually Allah just fulfilling the dua of their prophet Ibrahim al-Islam. Secondly, Allah is making it clear that God never promised Ibrahim al-Islam that his descendants from Isaac will always remain leaders till the end of times. In other words, the Ummah will always be with Bani Israel. On the contrary, what Allah argues is that leadership will be given to those who are righteous believers and those who strive to propagate and spread the truth. When a group deviates and becomes among the wrongdoers, leadership will be taken away from them. So given the rebellious nature of the Jews and the Christians who repeatedly distorted Allah's message and repeatedly transgressed his commands, it only makes sense that leadership should be taken from them. So instead of blaming Jibreel and calling Jibreel their enemy, Allah is telling them that they should understand this was the covenant made with their forefather Ibrahim salam. This was the promise Allah made with Ibrahim salam. If Jews and Christians are truly sincere to their forefather Ibrahim, they should not have any difficulty accepting a messenger from among Ibrahim's children, regardless of whether it is Bani Israel or Bani Ismail, because it doesn't really matter at the end of the day, it's still a descendant of Ibrahim a.s. Then verses 125 onwards, Allah says, and mention when we made the house 
a place of return for the people and a place of security. And take, O believers, from the standing place of Ibrahim, a place of prayer. And we charged Ibrahim and Ismail, saying, Purify my house for those who performed tawaf, and those who are staying there for worship, and those who bow and prostrate in prayer. And mention when Ibrahim said, My Lord, make this a secure city. Provide its people with fruits, whoever of them believes in Allah and the last day. And Allah said, and whoever disbelieves, I will grant him enjoyment for a little while, then I will force him to the punishment of the fire, and wretched is that destination. And mention when Ibrahim was raising the foundations of the house with him, Ismail, saying, Our Lord, accept this from us. Indeed, you are the hearing and the knowing. So when Ibrahim was instructed by God to go to Makkah, he was commanded to leave his second wife, Hajra, and his son, Ismail, over there. Now, of course, this was a very difficult test because at that time, Ibrahim only had one son, and that son was Ismail, and Ismail was just a newborn baby at that time. And of course, he had to leave them in Makkah, which was an uncultivated, barren land. It was a desert. Nobody was living there. So despite this being a difficult test, Ibrahim still obeyed Allah's order. And although he then returned to Jerusalem to his first wife, Sara, he would frequently visit Makkah. And several years later, he was commanded by Allah to build the Kaaba in Makkah with the help of Ismail. The Kaaba was to be made a place of assembly and security for all men, as explained in verse 125. It would be sanctified for all those who would come there to perform pilgrimage or those who use it as a place of retreat, and it would become a qibla, a direction of prayer. Now, the Quran does not mention that the Kaaba was built only for Bani Ismail. On the contrary, Allah says it was a structure designed for all men and women to come and worship God. That's why in verse 125, Allah tells Ibrahim salam that you have to make this house a place of return for the people. So that means it's basically for everyone. It's a place where everyone can come and worship Allah. In other words, Kaaba is symbolic of Tawheed. And that is why it was a Qibla that was meant to unite all people under one God. Now, since the message of Allah has always been consistent, the Qibla that was followed by all the messengers and prophets since the beginning of mankind must have been the same. Because if the Kaaba symbolizes Tawheed, and the message of Islam since the beginning of time has been centered on Tawheed, it is inconceivable that the Qibla was changing. So it has to be that the Qibla since the beginning of time for all the messengers and all the prophets has always been the Kaaba. They all must have been praying in the same direction and performing pilgrimage to the same place. Therefore, as many prophets came to mankind before Ibrahim salam, it is not plausible that the house of God was first built by Ibrahim and his son. That cannot be the case because if the Kaaba symbolizes Tawheed and if the Kaaba is a Qibla, a place of direction for all people, then the Kaaba must have existed even before Ibrahim a.s. In fact, in Surah Ali Imran, verse 96, Allah mentions that the first house assigned for mankind was the one at Makkah. And this reinforces the fact that it must have existed before Ibrahim a.s. Now, some scholars argue that the Kaaba was originally built by Adam a.s., the very first man, but the structure was damaged over the years, so it was reconstructed by Ibrahim a.s. Others suggest that perhaps it was first built by the angels. Allah knows best. These are different theories that have been put forth by scholars and have been mentioned in the Islamic literature. But of course, Allah knows best. We're not certain for sure who first built the Kaaba. But regardless, the Jews and Christians must ask themselves, have they followed the tradition of Ibrahim in visiting the Kaaba as a place of pilgrimage, performing tawaf, bowing and prostrating there, just as their forefather did? Do they give the Kaaba the same kind of significance that their forefather Ibrahim did? Now, once the Kaaba was rebuilt, Ibrahim prayed that Makkah be made into a city of peace with lots of sustenance so that believers would migrate to the city from all over Arabia. And in response, Allah answers his prayer by promising 
that all inhabitants, Muslims and non-Muslims, all of them will be given risk and sustenance, as mentioned in verse 126, but the final place of peace and rest will only be reserved for the servants of Allah. In other words, Jannah will only be for the servants of Allah who have Iman in Allah and who strove in Allah's cause. But yes, in dunya, Allah will give risk to everyone. So as a result, a desert that was not suitable for growing crops and food eventually thrived into a city dependent on trade between Yemen and Syria. In other words, the caravans of the Quraysh would travel to Yemen during the winter and then they would travel to Syria during the summer and that's how they made their money. That's how they became so rich. By monopolizing the trade route, Mecca was converted into a religious and a financial hub. It became the central core of Arabia. It became the most important city in the whole region. Now clearly Mecca had such significance for Ibrahim salam that he prayed to Allah for the safety and security of those in it who were true believers. It was in the same city that the final prophet arrived to reinforce the message of Ibrahim How could the Jews and Christians still not understand that Allah's selection of the final prophet being an Arab from Mecca, who was a descendant of Ibrahim was based on the prayer of Ibrahim Muhammad peace be upon him was not randomly selected. He was not a mistake made by Jibreel. It was the dua of Ibrahim that Mecca be made a secure city the center of Tawheed. So yes, while monotheists did live in Mecca before Islam, and I mentioned this before that they were called Hanifs, they would only worship one God, the fact that idol worship still spread in the entire city and in the entire region made it necessary to send the last prophet to Mecca. He had to be from Bani Ismail, he had to be a resident of Mecca, so that now the city of Makkah, which has become the main center of the Arab region, that city has to be cleansed of idol worship because once that city and that Kaaba becomes cleansed, the entire region automatically becomes cleansed. Similarly, in verse 127, Ibrahim salam prayed for the acceptance of his efforts in building the house of God. Now, this is a short and a beautiful prayer because it is a reminder that there are no guarantees of good deeds being accepted by Allah regardless of how significant they might be. It is this uncertainty that humbles the slave of Allah and protects him from arrogance. The decision of acceptance is only with Allah because only he is truly aware of man's intentions. In specific, a person's intention can be made clear by the words that he speaks or by the sincerity of his heart. And for that reason, the dua ends by referring to Allah as the all-hearing and the all-knowing, a samiul alim. In other words, only Allah knows the words uttered from someone's mouth and only Allah knows what is in that person's heart. So while insan's intention can vary for a short period of time, given the whispers of Iblis, given the attraction of dunya, given our nafs, Allah's forgiveness is vast. Allah knows that when we intend to do something, it is virtually impossible to make sure that our niyat every second is 100% only for Allah because being a human, being insan, having the, the vasvase of shaitan, having a nafs, we do tend to go back and forth a bit. We do tend to make mistakes. And Allah's forgiveness is vast because he's ar-Rahman. So yes, he knows that slight deviations for a couple of seconds, for a couple of minutes can occur. But it's the overall sincerity of intention and the overall purpose with which we do something, that is what Allah will reward. And that is why Rahim al-Salam is saying in this dua and teaching us that Allah, you hear everything that I say. You know exactly what is there in my heart. So if there has been a slight deviation, then Allah do forgive me. But understand Allah that my overall intention since the beginning was to basically do something for you. So please Allah, despite my deviations, Please do accept it. Then in verses 128 onwards, it is a continuation of Ibrahim salam's prayer where he's saying, Our Lord, make us Muslims to you and from our descendants a Muslim nation to you and show us our rights and accept our repentance. Indeed, you are the accepting of repentance and the merciful. Our Lord, and send amongst them a messenger from themselves 
who will recite to them your verses and teach them the book and wisdom and purify them. Indeed, you are the exalted in might and the wise. And who would be averse to the religion of Ibrahim except one who makes a fool of himself? And we had chosen him in this world, and indeed in the hereafter he will be amongst the righteous. When his Lord said to him, Submit, he said, I have submitted in Islam to the Lord of the worlds. From these verses, we can see that Ibrahim prayed that he and his son be made Muslims who submit to the will of Allah, with Muslims amongst their children as well. Furthermore, in his desire to please Allah, he asked to be shown the appropriate rites. In other words, what are the appropriate rituals? How is he supposed to worship Allah at the Kaaba? So all those rituals and rites of Hajj and Umrah were then taught to him. Now of all the prayers that Ibrahim has ever made to Allah, Allah chose to mention those in the Quran that help to clarify many of the misconceptions that are being spread by the people of the book. For example, in his prayer, Ibrahim refers to himself as a Muslim because he is submitting his will to Allah. And he's praying that his children should be Muslim. Not once does he mention the term Jew or Christian. Moreover, being the leader of religion and the founding father of the Jews and Christians, Ibrahim seeks Allah's guidance in terms of the rituals that he has to perform at the Kaaba for pilgrimage. He doesn't mention Jerusalem. He doesn't mention the Solomon's Temple. He doesn't mention any other religious site. He's asking Allah, teach me how to perform Hajj and Umrah in this place in the Kaaba. In addition, he prays to Allah that a messenger should be sent to his children from Ismail. That's why he says, Allah, please send a messenger from them. And who is them? Well, he's in Makkah at that time. So clearly he's referring to the children of Ismail who will be living there in Makkah. And so he's asking Allah, send a messenger from amongst them who will instruct them in scripture and wisdom. And this reiterates the message in verse 124 with more clarity. Bani Ismail received the last prophet because it was a prayer that Ibrahim made. He wished for a prophet to be sent from amongst Bani Ismail, who would teach and instruct them. So the religion of Ibrahim centers on the concept of submission to the will of one God. It does not focus on one Messiah or the chosen nation. It just focuses on Tawheed. If the Jews and Christians have deviated from the teachings of their founding father, then they're not actually following the Abrahamic faith. And it only makes sense that leadership should be taken from them. So they shouldn't be surprised at why Allah has chosen a new Ummah and the new Ummah is now from Bani Ismail. They shouldn't be surprised at why the last prophet is from Bani Ismail and not from Bani Israel. Now interestingly, the Jews don't deny Ismail as being the son of Ibrahim On the contrary, what they believe is that because he was a son of a prophet, Allah promised him 12 sons who would be strong and mighty princes forming a nation of their own. This is what they believed Allah promised Ismail because he was a son of Ibrahim. But they argue that Allah made a promise with Ibrahim that although he will give Ismail 12 sons and they will be princes and they will have their own nation and they will have power, messengers and prophets will only be given to the children of Isaac because Ismail was the son of a slave woman. This is the belief of the Jews. So it would be inappropriate or not suitable to send Allah's message to the progeny of Ismail. Now this entire argument can easily be rejected on the basis that Hajra was not a slave woman. Hajra was in fact the daughter of the king of Egypt. In other words, even before she became the wife of Ibrahim, she was a princess of high status and authority. And furthermore, the prayers of Ibrahim have been recorded in the Quran to prove that he prayed for all his children and Allah accepted his prayer. And at no point did Allah make a promise that he will send prophets only to Bani Israel. Then verses 132 onwards, Allah says, And Ibrahim instructed his sons to do the same. And so did Yaqub, saying, O my sons, indeed Allah has chosen for you this religion, so do not die except while you are Muslims. 
Or were you witnesses when death approached Yaqub, when he said to his sons, What will you worship after me? And they said, We will worship your God and the God of your fathers, Ibrahim and Ismail and Isaac, the one God, and we are Muslims submitting to him. That was a nation which has passed. It will have the consequence of what it earned, and you will have what you have earned, and you will not be asked about what they used to do. So now Allah moves to discussing Yaqub salam, the father of the 12 tribes of Bani Israel. Not only did Yaqub salam tell his 12 sons to submit their will to Allah as Muslims, but he also emphasized the importance of following their forefathers, which included Ibrahim, Isaac, but also Ismail. So if Prophet Yaqub is calling himself a Muslim, and if he is regarding both Ismail and Isaac as being messengers who need to be respected, then why were the Jews and Christians relegating Ismail's status? Where did the Jews and Christians come up with this entire concept that Ismail salam's children are just not significant, they're not important, a prophet cannot be sent from them? Where has this jealousy and hatred come towards Bani Ismail when their forefathers, Yaqub salam actually had a lot of respect for Ismail? So as mentioned in verse 134, the people of the book should know that they cannot benefit from the good deeds of their righteous prophets, nor can they benefit from being part of a lineage. They have deviated so much from the message of their prophets that they cannot truly call themselves followers of Ibrahim or Yaqub. In other words, it is important to conduct your own research and search for the truth. Bani Israel will not be able to blame their ancestors for misguiding them when the truth has now come through the last Prophet, peace be upon him. These verses of the Qur'an are now making everything clear. If they still choose to follow their ancestors' beliefs, if they still choose to hate Bani Ismail and have hatred towards the, the last Prophet just because he's from Bani Ismail, then Allah is making it clear that they're not actually following Yaqub or Ibrahim so again, intercession is not going to be accepted. And if it is accepted, it's certainly not going to benefit them. So then in verse 135, it says, They say, be Jews or Christians, and then you will be guided. Say, rather, we follow the religion of Ibrahim, inclining towards the truth, and he was not of the polytheists. Now, the religion of Ibrahim was Islam. It centered upon submission to the will of Allah, making him a Muslim. He was not a Jew and he was not a Christian. In addition, while discussing Ibrahim salam, the Quran also clarifies a grave charge that was made against him in the book of Joshua, claiming that initially Ibrahim was an idol worshipper like his father and later on he converted to monotheism once he embraced prophethood. So before he, he was a prophet, he used to worship idols. And after he became a prophet, then he started to worship the one God. And Allah makes it clear in verse 135 that this is not true. At no point was Ibrahim a polytheist. That's why in verse 135, Allah ends by saying he was not of the mushrikeen. He never was. And again, this is important because Allah could have said he never did shirk. But when you use shirk as a verb, then it's important to see what tense is being used. If it's present tense and future tense, then maybe he was doing shirk in the past. If it's past tense, then maybe he's doing shirk in the future. So by using the word mushrikeen, mushrikeen is a noun. It doesn't have a tense, which means at no point in time ever was he a worshipper of idols. And this is true for all prophets because Allah takes it upon himself to safeguard his messengers from committing sins even before they become prophets. If messengers were idol worshippers before they became prophets, their nation would never take them seriously. Their nation would have so many reservations about them when they started to propagate the message of God and they would not be ideal role models for mankind because people would say, how can you be talking about one God? How can you be denying all of the other idols when you were the one who loved worshipping idols in the beginning? So nobody would take their message seriously and they would never be considered to be good role models. The only reason that prophets are considered to be excellent role models and people take their message seriously, even the non-Muslims, is because they understand that these are people who even before they became prophets, they were known for tawhid, 
They were known for never worshipping idols. They were known for their character, for being truthful and honest. That's what makes their message appeal to even the non-Muslims. If the Prophet, before embracing prophethood, was involved in all kinds of sins, such as shirk, such as zina, such as all kinds of evil, then nobody would take them seriously and their hearts would never testify to the truth. And then, of course, if their hearts don't testify, they can complain to Allah on the Day of Judgment and say, Allah, we were genuinely confused because the man that you chose to be a prophet was a man we had seen commit so many sins in our lives. It was hard for us to understand how can he suddenly become a prophet. Right? So as a result, Allah makes sure that his prophets, even before they become prophets, never commit huge crimes. They are never involved in massive sins. In fact, by emphasizing that Ibrahim never associated anyone or anything with God, this also suggests that Christians believing in the concept of Trinity are not following the religion of Ibrahim. Associating Jesus with God defies the concept of monotheism. So this is Allah giving a beautiful reality check to the Jews and Christians. That if you people genuinely feel that intercession will be accepted and it will benefit you, then just think about it for a moment. Are you actually following Ibrahim a.s.? Are you actually following Yaqub a.s.? Are you really practicing the Abrahamic faiths? Because if you have deviated from them so much, then how could you possibly think, that intercession from Ibrahim or Yaqub could possibly benefit you. So inshallah, we'll stop over here, continue on in the next session with the next verses. But do take a moment to appreciate how Allah is intervening and providing these intellectual sound arguments to challenge the Jews and Christians. This is what Muslims are supposed to do as well. We have to gain as much knowledge and wisdom as we possibly can so that when we argue, we argue with wisdom. We argue with knowledge so that nobody else can make a fool out of us. The non-Muslims cannot confuse us, but at the same time, we should be able to challenge them. We should be able to provide such sound, intellectual and wise arguments that they are forced to reflect and they are forced to testify in their hearts, at least, that Islam has to be the truth and they are definitely following a wrong path. Assalamu alaikum.